हेलो 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 ओके सो यस सो हेलो This is so difficult. <laughs> yes, hello. So somebody has joined. Okay, they have left. <laughs> yes. So, uh, so, so, uh, so, so for the last time, I have got to ask you confirm everything before beginning the stream. Can you hear my voice? Question number two is can you see my face? And question number three is can you see my screen? Please reply one, two, three. Hear my voice. See my face. See my screen. Hello. 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 Okay, uh, can can you see the uh, can you see my screen well? Can you see me changing the tabs? Okay, good. Yes. So, yes. So, uh, this is. Uh, so, I really wanted to do a live stream, but I was too afraid to do it. But uh, now I've decided to go ahead and try doing it once. So, then I decided that uh, what can I do in a live stream? Like just doing a live stream for the sake of it doesn't make any sense. So. I decided to have a Cold War Generator Ideological Map Painting Session 1. So, so before we begin, what is the Cold War Generator? So the Cold War Generator is... Yes, so Tony Pro's Cold War Generator has been made by me. You can see the credits here and you can see more credits down here. But anyway... So it generates a random world of, like, it generates random scenarios. It generates random outcomes, endings, you know, like uh, the, the Fallout 4 kind of things. What happened? What was the history that shaped the world? And after much thinking, I decided to choose 1979 as the year in which the generator will end. So anything between the anything between 1955 and 1979 is fair game for this generator. And every time you click generate, you get a different outcome. And the generator focuses more on Latin America and the second and the third world. Because obviously, much of the first world was just boring democracies at the time. Not all, mind you, but most. And on top of generating uh, unique outcomes for almost every single nation in the world, with very few exceptions, it also generates other fun stuff like results of the FIFA World Cup or the Asian Football Cup or the Cricket World Cups. And also stories of people like Princess Margaret, Joe Biden, Jonestown, Che Guevara, Forrest Gump, Goodfellas, Casino a random character, and also, <laughs> just for the sake of it, James Hadley Chase outcomes. Okay, so mind you, this video will be pretty boring if you're not interested in it, because obviously, who wants to listen to a guy just 
reading something and painting a map for who knows half an hour one hour so either you will be very interested or you won't be interested at all anything is fair the, I, i'm just doing this to test whether i can stream everything correctly so without further ado let's begin with our proper let's just say map painting session so actually i had this window open before so we are going to be doing this particular outcome another thing to note is that i have a very bad case of cold but nothing can stop me <laughs> and uh, i'm quite happy today because today i uh, today i post graduated i got my like i haven't got the degree officially but we can say that my post graduation has ended today so i'm now de facto master of thermal engineering so i'm quite happy because of that and so despite the cold i'm pretty excited to do this live stream okay so i'll take a quick look at what is going on in the chat <laughs> So three people are watching now. That is good enough for a first live stream. Again, if you are bored, then you can leave at any time. You can also feel free to ask any questions you want. I will be looking at the chat approximately every few minutes. Okay, so finally, let's begin. So. first things first <coughs> the usa is led by president morris udall of the democratic party so obviously in our timeline the united states was led at this time by jimmy carter so but in this particular instance of the world morris udall won the democratic primaries and went on to become president of america so morris udall is much more independent and liberal so let's start the painting right away so first of all i will just color the ussr red and it is marxist leninism <laughs> then we will have a uh, let's have let's have this color for liberalism So this color is liberalism. <laughs> yes. So if anyone is wondering for any reason what an anemometer means, it means an instrument used to measure wind speed. I've been using it for my master's project, and of course, Google and Amazon know everything, so they are peering into my life. But ignore that. Let's just continue with the stream. So I mark the USSR as Marxist Leninist, America as liberal. <laughs> you you okay, so let me explain this to you. You can ask me any questions and I may or may not answer them in the chat itself. And you can also talk about something else if you want. This is an interactive session. I'm not giving a lecture here. You can talk about anything you want. and we will all participate together this is my first live stream so it is not very strict <laughs> you can also give your opinion about things if you want okay so this generator also shows you outcomes for two states of virginia and florida but for now we are going to be ignoring that <laughs> then we have premier mikhail suslov here So in this timeline Brezhnev dies earlier. Now why does he die? Because for all his life Brezhnev was a pretty heavy smoker. And being the being the leader of a world power like the USSR is obviously going to bring quite a lot of stress with it. And so Brezhnev dies and Suslov along with uh, basically in a troika with Konstantin Chernev Cher Chernenko and Grigory Romanov take over, and they are unflinching Orthodox Marxist-Leninists. 
So they want to reinvigorate the dying spirit of the USSR under the Brezhnev, what you can say, the Brezhnev fatigue. Anyway, now we are moving on. So the third is Hungary, and the masked Hungarian would like to see this. Okay, what is the question? What's your favorite toy for YouTuber? Okay. <laughs> So this is quite a controversial question because I have many favorite toy for YouTubers. I do love all of the, let me show you. <laughs> I do love all of the YouTubers here. And I also like quite a lot of the YouTube, the small YouTube channels of people who watch my videos like I can't remember the exact name, but basically Marshall Pilzutsky and Barbaro Ganija. I like Lemmingade. I, I love Lemmingade videos a lot. And okay, there are a lot of them. I cannot really tell you whom I like the most. But rest assured that I regularly click on the channels of people who comment on my videos and I watch their videos. So for example, David. Okay, there is no way to go to his channel now, but I know for certain that he had some videos on his channel once. <laughs> but anyway, let us continue with the subject matter. So in this timeline, by again, the year is 1979. So the Hungarian People's Republic is led by Bela Biscu of the Hungarian Socialist Workers' Party, so he came to power in 1972 after removing Janos Kadar with the help of KGB boss Yuri Andropov. And so under Janos Kadar, Hungary had a brief one and a half or you can say of uh, one and a half decades or many years of goulash communism, which was basically a kind of market socialism. But he never went out of line. So the USSR tolerated him. And so the standard of living of Hungary was among the best in the second world, in the Eastern Bloc. But, of course, Gaulash communism was not universally acceptable to everyone in the HSWP. And Bela Biscu, in our timeline, in the real world, he had actually tried to, you know, do what is written here, a plot to remove Janos Kadar with the help of KGB boss Yuri Andropov. But in our timeline, Yuri Andropov declined to help him. And so Bisco couldn't do it, but in this timeline, he does it. And so Hungary is returned to the orthodox command economy, Marxist-Leninism. So let us color Hungary red. And in any case, I am going to be coloring uh, Hungary, all the Eastern Bloc countries red because I don't want to create uh, too many sub ideologies. So that is it. So Hungary is red. <laughs> okay. So David Labaril is asking Can you give Jim Jones a control over Guyana in your map? No. As of today, no. But it's an interesting suggestion, maybe in the future. But let's continue. The next thing, okay, as I said earlier, I have very bad cold, but I'm going to fight this goddamn cold and do this live stream. <laughs> yes, so Romania is led by General Secretary Jorge Apostol of the Romanian Communist Party. So Jorge Apostol in our timeline, he was in our real world. He was one of the people who could have <laughs> succeeded Jorge Yorheu Deitch. And I know that I completely decimated the pronunciation of those names, but please pardon me. So Again, he was a little bit of the orthodox Marxist-Leninist, while in our real life, Romania was under Nikolai Kaushescu. And before his visit to North Korea, Kaushescu was actually heavily into market socialism, 
and that can be one of the outcomes that you get for Romania in this generator. But for now, we are going to be sticking to what we have got. So Romania is Orthodox Marxist-Leninist. <laughs> then we have Bulgaria. So this is again something interesting. So <laughs> man, this cold is really bad, but I have to do it. So <laughs> this, uh, so Todor Zivkov is basically just the same as in our timeline, the generator can give you things that were real in our timeline. So Bulgaria, again, is Marxist-Leninist, and he came to power after the fall of Stalinism in the USSR, implemented de-Stalinization in the 50s. Now he's a Brezhnevist. And his rule has been marked by unprecedented political and economic stability for Bulgaria. <laughs> so let us mark Bulgaria, again, as red. Now we come to... Countries like Yugoslavia and Albania. So I know this is a bummer, but Yugoslavia doesn't really have content in the generator as of now. I will be adding it later, but not as now. So I was actually debating what to do of socialist nations who were basically not a part of the USSR sphere of influence and who also didn't have a unique ideology like Maoism or something else. So then I'd, uh, so let us just mark Poland, Czechoslovakia, and East Germany as red, even though they are not in the generator. And yes, actually East Germany is there. So Horst Sinderman is first secretary. So coming back to it, uh, so then I decided to, like, I, I don't want to make a separate color for Titoism because I don't want to, you know, have too many sub-ideologies. So I decided to just make Yugoslavia and Albania as you'll see what I'm doing in a moment. Basically, non-aligned. Oh. Uh... Yes, so non-aligned socialists uh, Okay, no, even this is not working. I don't really know what to do. Uh, okay, so Okay, let's just have it as Stoism and Toxism. It is the spelling correct? H O X H A. Yes, H O X H A. So this, these two colors will, will represent both Titoism and Hoxism. I know this is a workaround, but I don't really want to increase the amount of colors too much. So moving on, then we have got, uh, so I will go very quickly over Western Europe because most of it is not what is the interesting part of this world. So West Germany is led by the Christian Democratic Chancellor Rainer Brazel, uh, Barzel of the CDU. So Christian democratism can basically say to be Liberal conservatism. <laughs> so this is West Germany. Then in Austria, again, we have Christian Democrats who are, <laughs> yes, so liberal conservative. And in the UK, we don't have the funny conservative lady. Instead, we have a labor lady. Barbara Castle of the Labour Party. So, before looking at a description, take a look at the previous PMs. So, everything un until Harold Wilson was the same. After Wilson, we got Edward Heath and the Conservatives until 74, then Wilson again until 76, and since then, we have got Barbara Castle. <laughs> so, she is basically... Uh, Yes, so she's basically a kind of social democratism, 
and social democracy will be pink. Okay. So we have marked Britain and let's go ahead. Then the French Republic, we have got Francois Mitterrand of the Parti Socialiste. This is again same as our timeline. This happened in our timeline and they are democratic socialists. <laughs> Okay, so let me take a look at who's watching once again. Uh, okay, so by this time, only three people are watching. <laughs> Kudos to all three of you. Uh, then we, in Spain, Francoism continues. So, Spain is ruled by King Alfonso II, and he is not the same as the king who rules Spain in our timeline. So basically, <laughs> Alfonso, Duke of Anjou and Cadiz, he was at one point a contender for the king of Spain via Franco. <laughs> but the, the main branch of the dynasty, they compromised a lot and got into cahoots with Franco and so Alfonso could not become king. But in this timeline, Alfonso becomes the king and Luis Carrero Blanco doesn't die in a bomb blast. So Spain remains under Francoism. <laughs> and again, I debated what ideology should I give to different branches of the right wing. So then I decided to have Francoism be military junta and not fascism because by the 1970s, Spain was definitely not fascist. It was, it was a, a kind of far-right military junta, we can say. It wasn't actually a military junta in the strictest sense either. It was more of an ideological, personalist dictatorship. But military junta is the closest we can go without being too particular about the ideologies. So Spain is going to be a military junta. Okay, so the masked Hungarian is asking this. So the reason that I'm not making a Discord server is because I'm, quite frankly, afraid of making it. I'm not the kind of person who can ban people easily. <laughs> I literally feel sad when banning people. And such a kind of person should not have a Discord server of his own because it will quickly descend into anarchy. I might make one in the future when I will have a community much, much bigger than this, but for now, I'm not going to be making a Discord server. <laughs> so continuing on. Uh, so yes, so Portugal is shown in the Africa section, and the reason is return here. Its domestic policy has affected the lives of millions in the continent. <laughs> so let us see Portugal quickly. And quite frankly, the reason for keeping Portugal here is because the code is the code of Portugal is tied to Mozambique and <coughs> Angola. <laughs> so Portugal is corporatist under Marcello Catiano of the National Union. So in this timeline, a brutal civil war took place after the death of Salazar immediately in 1968. So since this generator has any POD after 1955, right up till 1979, we can say that Salazar mismanaged Portugal more than he did in our timeline. So that when he died, the country just erupted into a small civil war. Now, this is not really an all-out civil war. You can say it's more of a it's more of a huge insurrection that was easily crushed with the help of the Americans. But it enabled Marcello Katyanov to cement his power. So again, it is quite confusing to describe a far-right dictatorship like Portugal. So I decided to give it the denomination of 
a right wing civilian civilian dictatorship right wing civilian dictatorship because the the new order regime of salazar wasn't really kept in place with the help of the military the military had a far less hand in internal politics than in franco spain <laughs> then then we got greece which is the same as our timeline it is a liberal democracy under constantinos karamanlis so he's a liberal so greece is liberal okay now we move on to the juicy stuff europe is boring yes i said that europe is boring in the cold war i mean western europe is boring i mean it is at least more more boring than the rest of the world because it is quite uh, it is quite stable let's just say and um, i haven't really included some of the more out there options because of two reasons the first reason is that they were unrealistic and the second reason is that this is a generator it depends on very basic code so sometimes it is impossible to predict what might have happened had you changes in the histories of western european democracies taken place so much of the content for that is pretty stable let's just say anyway moving on so the arabs have no respite because even in this alternate history they got defeated in 1967 but but in the yom kippur war the egyptian leader did not go to help the syrians so egypt maintained its sam positions on the on the east bank of the suez and as a result the idf the israeli defense force failed to cross the suez so as a result of this by the time the ceasefire happened the egyptians could claim a sort of ideological victory over the israelis that they had managed to quote unquote defeat the israelis and this will have major repercussions in the future because the egyptian leader who is not anwar sadat in this alternate history will be quite revered in our timeline anwar sadat was hated by the rest of the arab world because first of all he mishandled the yom kippur war and secondly he made a deal with israel for the return of the sinai and this led to his assassination shortly after anyway in israel we have a conservative mafdal party so let's mark conservative so the mafdal was a sort of conservative jewish party okay, let me move democratic socialism here social democracy here yes and then we move on to yes so this generator also has varying outcomes for some of the mossad operations that have taken place across history so first of all we have adolf eichmann so that so for this particular alternate history they managed to capture eichmann but he was killed while trying to escape so israel couldn't hold him on trial or bring him back to israel Meanwhile Joseph Mengele was never caught then Herbert Kukurs was a Latvian mass murderer and Nazi collaborator and the Mossad in this timeline never managed to find his whereabouts but in our real world the Mossad did manage to find Herbert Kukurs and then we have Eli Cohen or some people may call him Kamel Amin Tabet so in our timeline he went deep into Syria but he was found in the mid 1960s and executed by the Syrians but in this timeline Eli Cohen failed to get into the Mossad so nothing happened at all he remains an office worker that's a bummer and then 
Ali Hassan Salameh. So the 1972 Munich attacks, they failed. So the Palestinians could not kill any of the Israeli athletes. <laughs> that is quite different from what happened in our timeline. And But in this timeline, Yasser Arafat was killed in a Mossad shootout. That is a major change. And after him, Abu Jihad took over. And differing from Arafat's policies, he has involved the Palestinian Liberation Organization more directly into the Fedayeen, basically the greater Palestinian guerrillas. Now we move on to Egypt. So in this timeline, we don't have Anwar Sadat. Instead, Colonel Hussein al shafei takes power after the death of Nasser. He is a committed Nasserist an anti-monarchist and opposes all talks of a treaty with Israel. But he has reduced the secularism of the regime and allowed Islamic groups a greater say in the regime. So he is going to be Arab nationalist and I'm choosing this color for Arab nationalism. Okay, so four people are watching. Whoever is watching this quite honestly boring live stream, welcome. <laughs> this live stream is not for those who want excitement. This is quite boring. This is just me looking at my Cold War generator and coloring countries. Yes, so now we come to something interesting. In this timeline, Hafiz al-Assad was murdered by the Islamic Brotherhood in 1979, and his brother Rifat al-Assad, the hardline Ba'athist, took over. And as a result of his extreme force, Syria has now descended into a state of civil war between Rifat al-Assad of the Ba'ath Party, Syria-dominated faction, and the Islamic nationalist supreme guide Isam al-Attar, who is leading the Islamic Republic of Syria with the Syrian Muslim Brotherhood. They are supported by Islamists, conservatives, Sunni generals, because the Al-Assad brothers are Alawites, and also by Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, Jordan, and, hey, I think Israel also supports them. But don't tell this to anyone, okay? <laughs> yes. So it is basically Baathism, at least the Neo-Baathism, what you can call, which is, which differs from Mitchell Aflaq's Orthodox Baathism versus the Islamists. And this will be marked on the map as this color, which basically signifies civil war or anarchy. So many countries in this generator can fall to civil war or anarchy. So unfortunately for us, the civil war has just started by the time we are looking at this generator. So the generator doesn't give you a prediction of what the outcome of the civil war will be. That is for you to imagine. So moving on. Here, instead of Saddam Hussein or the Ba'athists, we have Abdul Rahman Arif. So in our timeline, he was the leader of Iraq for a very short time. So Abdul Rahman Arif is an Arab nationalist in name, but he is actually more of an Iraqi nationalist. And he has also liberalized the economy. So he is more like one of those Latin American dictators who allow foreign companies while keeping a firm hand on the country that they rule. But still, we have to mark him as Arab nationalist because that is closest to what he is. Then we got Jordan, which is ruled by King Hussein bin Talal. This is the same as our timeline. So Monarchy will be marked with purple, the color of royalty. So actually, let us have this light purple. So, monarchism. 
Okay, so you might be wondering why I haven't marked the United Kingdom or Spain as monarchism because monarchism, quote unquote monarchism on this map signifies those monarchies where monarchism itself is the ideology. So I will keep this uh, below conservatism. Okay, so now five people are watching the stream. So I would like to repeat that if you have any questions or if you want to discuss anything that is off topic, then please feel free to speak anything you want. Yo, it's Shuki. It's Shuki, my favorite YouTuber. So Shuki, please come to live status. Yes. So Shuki is one of my favorite liminal space YouTubers. I like his channel a lot. But anyway, continuing on. Please subscribe to Shuki's channel. I have if you're interested in liminal stuff. Okay, moving on. Uh, then we have Oman. Okay, another interesting thing. So in this timeline, the coup d'etat of Prince Qaboos bin Said against his father failed. And Prince Qaboos bin Said perished in the coup, and his father later died of natural causes in 1972. So instead of our real life's Oman, where Prince Qaboos bin Said came to power and instituted many reforms, he's dead in this timeline. So we have his uncle, which is Sultan Tariq bin Taimur. Now, Tariq bin Taimur is not a reformist, so he will keep Oman as a repressive monarchy. And at the same time, his rapport with the British was bad. So the Dhofar Rebellion, which is basically a ragtag bunch of, let's just say, guerrillas or revolutionaries who are Marxist-Leninists, so this, it succeeded partially. So they managed to break off the small Dhofar region. So let me show you what is the Dhofar region. Yes, so the Dhofar region is basically, yes, this part. So since Tariq bin Taimur is not a reformist, he's not popular with the people of Oman, and his rapport with the British is not good, the Dhofaris managed to secure some shock victories and carved out a microstate for themselves. So I will mark the red portion of the map later, but for now I will mark Oman as monarchist. So I can always just edit a small red portion after I've downloaded this map and I open it in paint. There is no way to, you know, insert any lines or borders inside these borders in map chart. Then moving on to Yemen. So in this timeline, there is no Nasserist rebellion in Yemen. So there is no Yemeni civil war. So Abdullah al Salal's coup of 1962 fails and Yemen remains a monarchy. The Muttal, the Muttabakhilid kingdom of Yemen under Inam Muhammad al Badr. And as a result of North Yemen remaining a strong monarchy, the South, rebel the South Yemen Rebellion, the Aden Emergency, fails. So we'll mark North Yemen as monarchist, and we will mark South Yemen as being under colonial rule. Now, mind you, Britain doesn't really rule South Yemen. What it has is that it is more akin to the British Raj, basically a bunch of different emirs and sheikhs rule the region of South Yemen while the British rule Aden and they maintain a sort of supremacy over the region of South Yemen. But despite all this, I will have to mark this as colonial rule. So this is the ideological map until now. <laughs> yes, so then we got Iran. So in this timeline, 
there is no Islamic revolution. The revolution fails. And the Shah puts the country under martial law, under General Abbas Garabagi. So he names him as the prime minister. Actually, like earlier, the Shah had appointed Ghulam Reza Azri as the military dictator of Iran, like a constitutional monarchy with Ghulam Reza Azari as the military dictator. So, he, so by 1979, which is the year of this generator, he has retired. And he is succeeded by General Abbas Garabagi. So we will, so like, I don't really know whether to mark this as a military junta or as monarchism, but since Iran in this time period is often seen as a clash between monarchism and Islamic revolutionaries, and since the Shah still holds a lot of power, I will mark, his, I will mark Iran as monarchism. And let me mark Kuwait. The UAE and Qatar also as monarchies. So as a result of this, the Middle East will be quite stable. Hey, who am I kidding? The Middle East might be stable because of Iran, but there is a literal civil war going on in Syria. <laughs> and everybody in the Middle East will participate in it. It has just begun by 1979. Then we have Turkey, which is under the left Kemalist president. Poland Esevit, and I will have to mark left Kemalism as a form of social democracy because that is what Poland Esevit wanted. He wanted Turkey to be a social democratic nation with Kemalist principles. Okay, now moving on to Libya. Yes, as someone in the chat has rightly said, there is no Gaddafi here. Instead, we have Colonel Abdul Aziz Shalhi. Now, what many people may not know is that Colonel Abdul Aziz Shalhi was actually senior to Gaddafi, and he was actively planning a coup in Libya, in cahoots with Gamal Abdel Nasser. But basically, he, he didn't do it. Like, he delayed it, he procrastinated. You know, the thing we do when we have a lot of homework, but we don't do it, and then we get scolded. So basically, that's what happened. Abdul Aziz Shalhi, in our timeline, he lost his chance and Gaddafi became dictator. But in this timeline, he does it. And unlike Gaddafi, Abdul Aziz Shalhi is much more closer to the Arab nationalist principles of Gamal Abdel Nasser. So he overthrows the monarchy. And again, it is quite Libya, basically the Libyan Arab Republic, it is quite similar to Egypt under Nasser. So it is a sort of dictatorship, and the new government has rejected communism. It has state capitalist policies, oil and banks have been nationalized, and the old Islamist stuff has been put aside in favor of in favor of secularism. So it is basically Nasserism. So let's mark Libya as Arab nationalist. Then we have Tunisia, which is under Habib Bourguiba. So this is the same as our timeline. And basically, the only different thing is that the Bizerte crisis in this timeline ended with the Tunisian victory. In the real world, in the real history, Tunis failed to conquer Bizerte, but the French gave it to them anyway in a referendum a few years later. But in this timeline, Habib Bourguiba's surprise attack on Bizerte in 1961 succeeds, and this results in Tunisia becoming his dictatorship. So I will mark him as a right-wing civilian dictatorship. And he's not Arab nationalist. He's actually quite, he's actually non-alignment with pro-American tilt. Then we have Algeria, which is led by the Islamic socialist president, Beyonce Benkeda. So we assume that Beyonce Benkeda took power in Algeria instead of Ahmed Ben Bella. 
and he managed to win every single election after that. So he is a sort of conservative because he's an Islamic socialist. Uh, it is quite difficult to say what to mark him as, but although he does have some socialist ideas like reformism and secularism, he is still an Islamist wing of the National Liberation Front of Algeria. So I will mark him as conservative. This is one of those unicorn ideologies where I don't really know what to mark him as. But then we come to another interesting thing. The Republic of Morocco. Yes. The kingdom is no more. Lieutenant Colonel Mohamed Ababou has assassinated King Hassan II and removed his government and abolished the monarchy in his 1971 coup with Libyan help. So he rises to popularity because he makes a massive phosphate trafficking ring public and it involves dignitaries in the king's entourage and American companies. <laughs> so again, he institutes all the different land reforms, the old royalist structure is torn down, and he builds a rapport with the urban elite and the middle class. <laughs> and since he's a Nasserist, he distances Morocco from the West and joins the non-allying movement. So Morocco is no longer a monarchy, it is Arab Nationalist Republic. <laughs> okay, so yes. Now we move on to Western Sahara, which has been divided up between Morocco and Mauritania. So you might have noticed this generator has lots of content and outcome for even nations like Western Sahara. So I will mark it as being occupied by Morocco. Then we have Mauritania, which is Islamic socialism under Mokhtar Auld Dada. Okay, once again, I'm unsure of what to mark this as, but I know for a fact that unlike the Algerians who could have become a democracy, Moh Dada was clearly a dictator, so he is marked as a right wing civilian dictatorship. Islamic socialism is really difficult to mark as any ideology in the context of this coloring. So please pardon me if you think this is not the right color for them. And then we have China. So there is no Dengism in this timeline. No, no. Instead, we have Chairman Hua Kofeng. So he is the designated successor of Mao, and he was premier for some time before Mao's death. After that, he became the leader of China. He purged the Gang of Four and outmaneuvered Deng Xiaoping. So after coming to power, he reversed some of the Cultural Revolution era policies such as the constant ideological campaigns, but he's fully devoted to a command economy. So there will be no Dengist market economy here. And he has started a new five-year plan for light industry and agriculture. Now, the generator has two sub-outcomes for Hua Guofeng. He can either have a USSR-style 10-year plan or he can have a five-year plan if he compromises with Deng Xiaoping's men. So in this outcome, we have the latter. But in spite of whichever sub-ideology takes over, Maoism is going to be marked as Maoism. So I'm selecting... Uh, so for Maoism, I guess I'll select the color orange. <laughs> Moving on. Okay, so whoever is watching, how are you? How are you? Please type something. <laughs> and then the generator has different outcomes for the status of Hong Kong. So in this outcome, after the outburst of violence and rebellion in Hong Kong in 1967, a crisis develops between China and the UK. Finally, the British cave in to the Maoists and they give widespread powers to Yong Kong and his Hong Kong Federation of Trade Unions. After that, we have the Republic of China, which is 
despotic nationalist president Chiang Ching Kuo. This is the same as our timeline. And they will be a right-wing dictatorship. Okay, this is Maoism, and it goes here. <laughs> so again, this is going to be the Republic of Taiwan is going to be a right-wing civilian dictatorship. <laughs> then we have the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, which is Maoist in this timeline. Okay, so from this point on, I'm not really be going to read everything because then the stream will never end. And we are on a limited time here. So you can feel free to read this stuff. If you are watching the stream after it has ended, then you can just pause the video and read the descriptions. So basically, Kim Il-sung was removed in 1956 and this thing almost happened even in our real life history. So the DRPK is much more closer to China in this timeline. <laughs> and then we have South Korea, which is still led by the dictatorship of Illuminism under President Lee Ki Pung of the Liberal Party. Yes, I know this is controversial. The Liberal Party was a sort of quote unquote fascism. And in our timeline, Syngman Rhee's dictatorship fell in the early 1960s, but in this timeline, it doesn't fall. And South Korea remains a dictatorship, a right wing dictatorship. But since this is a party dictatorship and not a military junta, I've marked this as a right-wing civilian dictatorship. Then, after that, we have Philippines. So there is no funny man Marcos here. Philippines remains a strong democracy. And as of 1979, it has been led by the Liberal Party for the last 14 years. So first we had Maka Pagal, and now we have Gerardo Roxas, who is on his second term. And both Maka Pagal and Roxas serve two terms. So there have been four terms of the Liberal Party. Similarly, Japan is conservative. But I'm going to mark Japan as liberal conservative and not completely conservative. Yes, and the Philippines is liberal. Now, I know that the Philippines may not really be as liberal as the standard of Europe, but we are going with the de jure ideology of Philippines here, the de jure ideology of the Philippines here. And then we have the Union of Burma, which is led by the socialist president Ne Win of the Burma Socialist Program Party. So, okay, so again, there is no clear way to say what these people are. So I will add him to this. Titoism, Hoxaism, and Navin. Basically, he's a member of the non-allying movement, but he is a hardline socialist. After that, we have Vietnam, which remains divided along the 17th parallel. but. Unlike our timeline, Viet North Vietnam is Maoist and South Vietnam is nationalist. So I'm not going to be marking anything here. I will edit this map later. Basically, North Vietnam is Maoist, South Vietnam is nationalist. Hey, actually, for the moment, temporarily, I have an idea. Let me mark countries which are in an ongoing which are not in civil war, but which have been divided as this color. So this color marks divided into Yes. 
So Vietnam is divided into North Vietnam is Maoist, South Vietnam is nationalist. Then we have the Khmer Republic, which is led by the despotic president, Commander Sostene Fernandez. He came to power. Yes, yeah, so basically this is a military junta. Cambodia is military junta. There's no Pol Pot in this timeline. Then we have Laos, which is monarchist. So again, Laos did not go socialist in this timeline. It is led by Prime Minister Foy Sana Sana Nikon. Now he can also be marked as a military junta, but since the popular, let's say, the face-off in Laos is between monarchism and communism. So I'm going to be marking it as monarchism because the prime minister has not completely dominated the king. The king still holds a lot of power. Then we have Thailand, which is led by a military junta. Now, in this case, I am going to be marking this as a military junta because the king has very little power. Most of the nation is dominated by Prime Minister Manun Krit Rup Kachon. So this is again one of those uh, dilemmas. What should I mark Thailand as? Military junta or monarchism? Actually, let the chat decide. So this is the description of Thailand. I will let the chat decide. Until then, I will move ahead. So Indonesia is led by Abdul Harris Nasution, and he succeeded Sukarno after the latter's death in 1970. So there is no Suharto or the new order in this timeline. Sukarno survives Suharto's coup. And so Indonesia is a right-wing civilian dictatorship. But, but, Operation Tricora has failed. So Dutch New Guinea, basically this part here, is not under the Indonesians. But once again, due to the limitations of map chart, I cannot really mark it as such. So please keep this in mind. Dutch New Guinea is now the Republic of West Papua under President Jacob Pry. And the <laughs> Sukarno also failed in the attack on East Timor. No, actually, Sukarno is dead by this point. So Abdul Harris Nasusha. So he has failed. So there is no reply. So I guess I'll just mark Thailand as monarchism. And I know for a fact that Malaysia was conservative. So Malaysia has not yet been added to this generator, but I will add it as conservative. And then we have India, which is led by the social liberal prime minister Neelam Sanjeeva Reddy. He's the successor of Lal Bahadur Shastri. And the generator also has unique outcome for the status of Nagaland. So in this timeline, Indira Gandhi has been completely sidelined by Lal Bahadur Shastri and his successor Neelam Sanjeeva Reddy. So India is liberal. <laughs> then we have Pakistan, which is under a power sharing agreement. And Mujibur Rahman rules East Pakistan. Now he's democratic socialist and Zulfikar Ali Bhutto rules West Pakistan. He's social democratic, but since the nation as a whole is united, like it is a basically federal structure. So I will mark the entire Pakistan as a social democracy. So Pakistan remains united in this timeline. And even though Nepal and Bhutan are not in this generator, I'll still mark them as monarchies because I know they were. 
And then Afghanistan is the same as in our world. It is led by the Stalinist chairman Noor Muhammad Tarakai, but it is not completely same. See, in the real world, Noor Muhammad Tarakai was removed by, okay, I forgot the name of his successor. Was it Hafizullah Amin? Yes, by his successor Hafizullah Amin. And by 1979, Amin had invited the USSR. And Hafizullah Amin, he destabilized Afghanistan. But in this timeline, Noor Muhammad Tarakai continues and Afghanistan is much more stable than in our real life. So there is no Soviet invasion, at least as of 1979. So Afghanistan is Marxist-Leninist. And let's just mark Mongolia too. Then Sri Lanka is democratic socialist, Australia is liberal, New Zealand is conservative. Oh. So I think Asia has almost ended now. Okay, so finally someone has replied that I must mark Thailand as a military junta. Good. So I will mark it as a military junta. <laughs> Mind you, Thailand is still a monarchy. It is, but the actual power is held by the military junta. <laughs> then we have Mexico, which is again a one party state. <laughs> so marking Mexico here. <laughs> Actually, uh, let us just have this as a civilian dictatorship because pre is not really okay, so yes, so this is a civilian dictatorship. Hmm. Then the Dominican Republic is conservative democracy, so a strong democracy exists in the Dominican Republic in this timeline. Hmm. There is no military junta. Same goes for Honduras. Basically, the the 1963 military coup failed, and Honduras became the lucky Latin American country. <laughs> it managed to hold on to power, and yes, so basically, it is liberal. And now I have another dilemma. What to mark the Sandinismos as? The Sandinismos as? So Sandinismo is not really Marxist-Leninist. It is... Uh, but since they are not really enemies of the USSR like Tito or Hogza or Nevin, like they are not radical non-alignment, pro-non-alignment, I will be marking... Nicaragua as ma Marxist Leninist. No, wait, wait, wait. I have another idea. Yes, this is a better idea. I will mark it as left wing nationalism. <laughs> so let me select this color. So Sandinismo is left wing nationalism. <laughs> and I can now change Navin. And Enver Hogza to left wing nationalism because that's what they actually fit most with. <clears throat> so, left wing nationalism. <clears throat> okay, moving ahead, Panama is conservative, Grenada is <clears throat> still a colony of the British. But I can't really mark Granada on this map anyway because it is very small. But Panama is conservative. So let me quickly mark Panama. Then Trinidad and Tobago is led by the left-wing nationalist Prime Minister Rafiq Shah of the military. He came to power after the 1970 Black Power Revolution. 
Again, Trinidad and Tobago cannot really be colored well on this map, but I will mark them as left-wing nationalism. <laughs> okay, yes, so I don't think you can actually see it, but I've marked it. And the generator doesn't really have alternate outcomes for Cuba yet, so it is Marxist-Leninist. <laughs> Then we got Venezuela, which is Christian Democratic, and the generator also generates different outcomes for all the elections of certain countries like Venezuela, the United Kingdom, Australia, New Zealand, and Brazil, and some others. So Venezuela is Christian democracy, but this is Latin American Christian democracy, so I'm going to be marking it as conservative. Then we have Brazil is also conservative, so there is no military junta in this timeline. There was a military coup, but democracy was restored in 1956, and democracy has stood strong since then. The conservative UDN, Uniao Democratica Nacional Party, has held Brazil since 1966. So it looks like for any reason, so you as the reader can. Just think of any reason. The left is not really popular in Brazil. Even Varguism is not that popular. So in the last, in the last uh, 24 years, the UDN has been in power for 19 years and counting. So Brazil is conservative. Then we have Argentina, which is liberal. So there is no Peronism and there is no military junta. Peron was never allowed to return. <laughs> so Argentina is liberal. <laughs> now Chile is not that different from our timeline, but it is also not the same. Instead of Pinochet, we have Roberto Viox, who is, let's just say he is Pinochet on drugs. So he was a kind of, um, yeah, he wanted a more revolutionary right-wing junta. So he wanted radical changes to Chile and he wanted to convert it into a stratocracy where the military was paramount. So this is undoubtedly a military junta. And in our real life, he did try to seize power, but the Americans refused to help him. In this timeline, the Americans agree to help Roberto Viox, and so he gets the presidential seat. <laughs> then Uruguay, there is again no military junta. Democracy survives in Uruguay in this timeline. It is social democratic. And I forgot Bolivia, which is under General Hugo Panzer of the military junta. So he also works with former Nazi officer Klaus Barbie. So this is again a military junta in Bolivia. So the generator doesn't have content for Paraguay, Peru, Ecuador, Colombia, Guyana, Suriname, and French Guyana, and all these countries for now. But I am going to be adding content. The generator gets updated regularly. And then we have again Portugal managed to win. Basically, uh, the Salazarism succeeded in managing to hold on to power after Salazar's death. And as a result of that, Mozambique remains under colonial rule. So, Mozambique is colonial rule. <laughs> and uh, again, Angola is also under colonial rule, but Yona Savimbi's UNITA has entered a secret alliance with the colonial government of Portugal. So we have a syncretic regime where the Portuguese allow UNITA to rule parts of Angola in their name. But despite this, we are going to be marking Angola as colonial rule to simplify things. But keep this in mind. Savimbi rules parts of Angola. <laughs> oh, oh, oh my god, I forgot Turkey. Yes, I for Oh no, wait, I didn't forget it. Turkey is social democratic. 
under Bulent Esevit. I don't really know how to pronounce that, to be honest. So Sudan is same as our timeline. It is Arab socialist under Jafar Nimieri. So I will mark him as Arab nationalist. <laughs> Because that is what he's closest to, despite the fact that this is in Sudan, a country which is not really a part of the typical Arab states. But yes, Sudan is still a part of the Arab world. So Jafar, Jafar Nimieri's government is Arab nationalist. <laughs> and there was no 1971 communist coup attempt in this timeline, so he remains close to the USSR. Then we have Ethiopia and Somalia. So in this timeline, again, same as our timeline, but Siad Bari was defeated by the Ethiopian Empire. So there is no Minjitsu or the Derg regime. Ethiopia remains a proud monarchy. And when Siad Bari attacked the Ethiopian Empire to claim the parts of Ogaden, he was defeated by the American-sponsored army of the Ethiopian Empire. And it is led by the reformist Prime Minister Makonin. But despite this, I will be marking Ethiopia as monarchist. And since in this timeline, Sia the Bari actually was uh, supported by the Soviet Union, unlike in real life, he remains, like at least de jure, he remains a follower of orthodox Marxist-Leninism, although he has inserted several Islamic and scientific socialist elements into his ideology. I will be marking him Marxist-Leninist simply because he's diplomatically close to the USSR. <laughs> and, <laughs> yes. After that, we have Chad is Marxist-Leninist, so the hardline Marxist-Leninist wing of the Frolinat under Ibrahim Abacha has taken over. Now, Chad is Marxist-Leninist, but they are Pan-Africanist. And so, for this case, for this particular case, I'm going to be marking them as... <coughs> Uh, anyway, no, I'll mark them as Marxist-Leninist. Then, in this timeline, again, Mali is conservative. So, Mali is conservative. And Niger has fallen to communism under Jibo Bakari <laughs> and the Sawaba regime. So, the Sawaba regime is Marxist-Leninist. So there are now two communist countries in the heart of Africa and three if you count Siad Bari. Let's see what's ahead for us. Then after that, we have Ghana is liberal, Nigeria is Marxist-Leninist. So in this timeline, a huge part of the Sahel has fallen to Marxist-Leninism. And I'm sure that it is making Uncle Sam very uncomfortable about the state of Africa. Now, Ghana is liberal. So it is one of the few genuine democracies in Africa, and it, democracy was restored in 1969. It feels weird to have such a democratic country right in the heart of Africa. Then Guinea is democratic socialist. Now, of course, they are not really as democratic as some of the democratic socialist European nations, but I have to mark them as democratic socialist. Then we have uh, Ivory Coast is a military junta. Cote de Ivory. Okay. Sierra Leone is a military junta. Equatorial Guinea is a sort of party dictatorship. So Sierra Leone is military junta. And Equatorial Guinea... Hmm. 
is a right-wing, basically a civilian dictatorship under <laughs> under the National Unity Movement. So there is no mafias in Guema in this timeline. Equatorial Guinea remains a moderate nationalist dictatorship under Bonifacio Ondo Edu. Then Cameroon is social nationalist, which I interpret to be left-wing nationalism. <laughs> the Central African Republic, again, it is uh, a military junta. So it came, he came to power, General Alexandre Banza came to power after leading a coup against John Bidel Bokassa. And yes, so it is a military junta. Let's see. <laughs> then Zaire is under Mobutu Sese Seko. So uh, initially it was a military junta, but by 1979 it is a civilian dictatorship. It is a dictatorship under Mobutu Sese Seko, and the military has been like the military is not the true leader of the nation. The true leader of the nation is Mobutu Sese Seko and his kleptocratic band of politicians of the popular movement of the revolution. This is the same as in our real world. <laughs> then French Congo is led by the socialists, so it is Marxist Leninist. <laughs> Then we got Rwanda, which is led by the Parme Hutu. So for certain reasons, I cannot really read or tell you about this. You're free to read it by yourselves. I don't want YouTube to yeet me. But it is a civilian dictatorship. <laughs> and Uganda is led by Godfrey Benaisa. And they have come to power after the overthrow of Idi Amin. So again, Uganda is the same as in our world. Idi Amin has been recently removed as of 1979. So it is again a party dictatorship. <laughs> and then Burundi remains monarchist under Mwami Entare V. So there is no revolution in Burundi. The monarchy continues. So... Burundi is a monarchy. Then Kenya is led by the African Socialist President. Now, African Socialism is too unique an ideology to be included in any of this. And actually, this generator can have many African Socialist nations. So I will be marking African Socialism as this color. Because it is a very unique ideology. You can read about African Socialism on Wikipedia. <laughs> and I'm keeping it here. Let's shift Maoism here. Yes. So Kenya is African socialist, unlike in our real life, where Daniel Arab Moi <laughs> came to power and he was closer to the USA. But in this timeline, Kenya is closer to the USSR and they have you know, standard African socialist policies like land reform, communes, and all that. And Zanzibar is led by the esoteric ultra-nationalist president John Okelo, the Freedom Military Force. So he is a violent African ultra-nationalist. In real life, he was sidelined by the Tanzanians. But in this timeline, Tanzania has not formed at all. Zanzibar remains an ultra-nationalist dictatorship under John Okelo, and Tanganyika remains a party dictatorship. I cannot really call Oscar Kambona fully democratic. It is more like a one-party state. Like It is quite democratic by the standards of post-colonial Africa, but it is quite clear that the Tanganyika African National Union is the de facto party. Uh, but we can assume that since he is pro-West, the West pressurizes him to be more democratic. And so I'm going to make a controversial decision and mark him as a conservative democracy and not as a one-party state. 
even though it is quite possible that he is in fact a one party state. Then Malawi is African socialist, Zambia is conservative. So Zambia is conservative and Malawi is African socialist. So Hastings Bandar did not come to power in Malawi in this timeline. Instead, we have Kanyamu Chiume of the Malawi Congress Party. So it is now a one party socialist state which is led by the ideology of African socialism and it is heavily non aligned. <laughs> then again, southern Rhodesia is the same as our timeline. The Rhodesians have been defeated, and as of 1979, the British are temporarily in control of the colony, but it has been predicted that Zapu will win the elections. So it is slightly different from our world where Robert Mugabe's ZANU was coming to power after the elections. So instead of Mugabe, we will have a more Marxist-Leninist Joshua in Como regime. But as of 1979, we have to mark it as a colonial regime. South Africa is a one-party state, the apartheid dictatorship. It is the same as in our timeline. <laughs> and Madagascar is a military junta. Yes, so that is all the nations that we have in this generator marked, and some additional nations whose ideologies I know. So let me just go over what is the condition. So basically, the Germanic nations have turned to Christian democratism, while France has is democratic socialist. In Spain and Portugal, right wing dictatorships continue. Francoism in Spain. And okay, you know, I made a mistake earlier. I'm going to mark Spain as a party dictatorship, not as a military junta. So, so Spain and Portugal are both, they are both uh, basically right wing regimes. In the Balkans, we have Enver Hoxha and Tito, and then Greece is liberal. And the Middle East is going to be a tinder pot in this timeline because Syria has descended into open civil war. <laughs> and then uh, large parts of Africa are, are under Marxist Leninism, much more than in our timeline. But Ethiopia remains monarchist. And elsewhere in the Middle East, <laughs> we have a much more moderate. Arab nationalist regime in Iraq and Libya, there is no Gaddafi and there is no Ba'ath party. And Morocco is a republic in this timeline. Iran is not Islamist, but it remains a monarchy. Afghanistan is a communist dictatorship like in our timeline. Again, this is for 1979. I had to enable the 1978 map simply because Egypt has not signed any treaty with Israel because it is led by Colonel Hossein al Shafei. And North Korea is not Juche but Maoist. The pro Chinese faction has taken over. And again, in here, Vietnam is divided between Maoist North Vietnam and Nationalist South Vietnam. And there is no Pol Pot, and Laos also remains a monarchy. And in Latin America, there are no military dictatorships in Brazil and Argentina. Instead, there are democracies in both of these nations, but Bolivia and Chile are still dictatorships. Nicaragua has fallen to the Sandinistas, same as in our timeline. Honduras is liberal. The Dominican Republic is a democracy. <laughs> and yes, so some more smaller changes are that Kenya is African socialist, Malawi is African socialist, and large parts of Africa still remain under colonial rule of Portugal, and the British maintain their hold on South Yemen because the Republican coup in North Yemen failed. So there was basically no incentive for revolution anymore. 
And yes, that is it for today. I actually had the stream for testing whether I can do live stream successfully. And I must say that my first live stream has been a moderate success. At our peak, we had about 8 to 10 people watching it, but we always managed to maintain 3 to 4 viewers, which is a good thing. <laughs> so, okay, this is awkward. I don't really know what to say anymore, so I'll just say goodbye. Have a nice day, and I will join you some other day. Thank you.